Monday morning racer here, Lee Kraft, caught up with Tricky Ricky Smith in this Zoom interview brought to you by DragRacing.TV and powered by StrutMasters.com. Well, first off, Ricky, look, I know you talked to Wes Buck here lately, and you told him you've never seen anything like this in drag racing in the world. Have you ever, and you've already said you've never seen anything like this. Has anything ever shut down racing like this? No, sir. I was uh, probably one of the long ones out here, you know, 46 years doing this stuff. And I've been through a couple of, uh, I don't know if you call them depressions or, or, you know, things got tight and, you know, just people kind of shut down on their own, but uh, never seen a government shut us down like this. And, uh, pretty rough you know it's it's uh this virus deal is, is messed up a lot of a lot of countries a lot of businesses and uh most of all i guess what we live in our little world is it's messed up a lot of drag racers so it's it's tough but you know lee it, you know we all bitched and i did two weeks ago and when, when we had to leave gainesville and all that stuff but Man, once we see now how severe this thing is, if we don't all stick together and, and get ourselves a little quarantine, and I had not eaten out in a couple of weeks. My wife, she works every day, and we always eat out because she don't get home till five. And you know, we've been eating. She's been cooking supper every night, and me and Chad, we've been bringing our own lunch or eating soup out of a can here at the shop. So we've even got the door locked in the front of the shop, just kind of watching who comes in and out, you know, and we just got to try to help get through this and, and not, the cases are going to be bad. It's not hit totally yet. I think we know that. Uh, this thing's going to get a lot worse here in probably this week, and, but hopefully this thing will kind of level off maybe the end of the week or sometime next week as far as just traumatic cases coming about, you know, and, and, and the whole thing is, we're a big nation. The United States is a big nation. We can afford a lot of people maybe to get sick, but we can't afford our workers in the hospitals and the doctor's offices. If they all get what we got, now we're in big trouble. So that's the whole thing. It's just we need to try not to get sick so we don't go get them infected. So we just all need to stick together here. Unless, hell, ain't nobody out here wants to race no more than I do. I mean, other than John Forrest, he's probably about the only one crazy enough to stay out here 46 years, you know. But uh, we're going to get through it, and it's going to be tough. And, you know, it's, the strong always survive, and we just got to stay strong. And, and uh, let's all just lay back here and chill out for a good month and see where this deal goes. Yeah, we've well, got a forced vacation. I know that. You definitely want to be back out there racing. I want to be back out of the track covering racing however I can. But you good word there, Ricky. You've mentioned that, you know, we need to hunker down. We need to be together on this, self-quarantine. I Look, a lot of businesses have taken measures to help their employees out and make it through this. I'm curious, from a racing business perspective, what are some things you've done to make sure Chad's got what he needs and anybody else that is in operation with the team? Well, I guess in one way we're kind of lucky this happened here at the first of the season and I kind of bought up some spare parts going into the end of last year and just a few start the season. So I've kind of got a selection of tires and gear ratios and, and pistons and rods and, you know, so what I've had to spend, I've kind of got spent, okay? So basically what I told Chad is, if we're down two months, I may have to let him not work two weeks, okay? I want to try to keep Chad involved because he's got to have money just like we all have. But uh, hopefully we, we can get through this deal. And, and But we're right now, I just shut down all buying, you know, and it, I hate it. But until uh, I know we're going to go back racing and everything's cool and uh, – I just had to shut down. I just had to basically shut down. The only thing we're buying is food to eat right now. And like I say, I'm lucky I got enough stock, parts, gas, oil. Lucas Oil's got me all in here. We're good to go for a while. So uh, 
we're just waiting to go race now, you know, and, and get things underway and, and, and see where this still goes. I mean, I'm fortunate I got Chip, a strut master, and I kind of got a, a, an email last night and everything's going to be good and, and he's going to make sure he takes care of us right. And, and, and I think all I can do is just sit back and, and, and wait on the NHRA. Right now, I mean, the way I look at it right now, we miss Gainesville. We're going to miss Charlotte. And it looks like we could miss Virginia. Okay, so that's three races. I, my deal was with him to run the NHRA mainly. That was my deal. I'd run a couple of PDRLs. And we had this big money race in Orlando. So hopefully that's an extra race that got us some good media coverage, you know, that, that he can rely on for, you know, for my deal that, that I've been doing with him. And, uh, but hopefully the Charlotte race, we don't run Charlotte at the end of the year is what I'm hoping. That's what they put on the schedule to start with. Now, supposedly we're going to see something happen here tonight on the schedule. But uh, so hopefully where we don't run Charlotte at the end of the year, the NHRA will bring us back into Charlotte because I know Charlotte wants pro modified at <laughs> both of them races. So hopefully we get to go back to Charlotte at the end of the year and run that race. So now we're only down two. And Virginia, I know Tommy's going to try everything he can to get his race, you know, redone. So if we only, you know, and the pro mods only have to run 12 races. So we're not going to be down like some of the other pros are on, on some races here that they've missed. Because right now we've only missed one race. And it's going to be a month before we actually miss another race. So hopefully we end up maybe, maybe not missing but one race and it won't hurt my sponsorship and some of the pro mod sponsorship because we're going to get to run basically all of our races. So we just hope things get going here in the next two months. And if it does, then uh, I think the pro mod class will be okay. But we pay, I mean, we pay a lot of our purse. I mean, you know, we, we pay a thousand dollars to enter. So we paid NHRA $33,000 at Gainesville to enter. So, uh, we're almost a free show for them. So hopefully they'll, I know they're going to keep that in mind because things are going to get tight. And uh, this pro mod thing, hopefully we'll get to run all of our races because we're going to be able to bring this show in and not cost them a lot of money and the fans like it. So uh, that's all I'm hoping for is, is uh, we get to run all of our races. Definitely. Now, <clears throat> Ricky, you mentioned several things through that, dialogue from you that I would like to hone in on. First, you've had a lot of sponsors. There's been STP on the side of your car, Motorcraft, a lot of great brand names. What kind of sponsor is Chip Lofton and Strutmasters.com? Where do they rank up there in the sponsors you've had? Well, Chip, I mean, you know, like you say, I've, I had Motorcraft for seven years, STP for three, and uh, you know, Motorcraft, Ford. I mean, I've had some at GM, you know, not as a major sponsor, but a lot of associate stuff when I switched from Ford to GM and back in 89 and come right out and won a championship again with the, with the GM car. We won four pro stock championships out in a row. We were kind of on our way to dominating that class pretty bad. And, and then they wanted me to go run the NHRA. And I just, I kind of took that deal way, way too light on money to go run with people like Bob Glidden and Warren Johnson and, and, and the Dodgers. I didn't even have a third of the money they had. So uh, it kind of made me look bad in a way. Uh, but I know what I can do, and I know them drivers know what I could do, you know, at the time. So I, the deal with Chip, those sponsors come along when I was young, and I've had a lot of good American sponsors. You know, and when you stay out here four to six years, if you survive – 46 years, you're going to have a lot of sponsors. I mean, most sponsors are only going to, you know, you, you got to look at it. a lot of good sponsors. There's very few stay more than about six years with somebody seven, maybe, you know, and they, it ain't if they don't like what they do. They just, another marketing guy comes in and he don't like drag racing. He likes golf. So boom, there they go. You know, you're doing everything you thought everything was happy, but all of a sudden they got another marketing guy and he didn't care nothing about drag racing. He wanted to go play tennis or play golf. So there, there that went, you know, and that's kind 
kind of what happened to me on a couple of them, but I have no problem. All my American sponsors that I had was just great. I mean, and Chip has fell in here to the end of my career. And I really didn't want, I want to quit, but I don't want to quit. <laughs> it's a hell of a deal here. You know, uh, God has blessed me just to, to be competitive for basically 46 years. I mean, I started winning my championships in 1976. So I've been luckily a winner most of my career, you know, or a big threat. You know, I've had a few years off, but I just didn't have sponsor stuff. I had to go crew chief for Jim Yates. I had to go crew chief for Ron Krischer. I mean, I, had, I helped B gain some. I mean, there's a lot of good pro stock guys that I helped back in the day. When I didn't have a sponsor, I kept my stuff, luckily. I never got rid of my stuff. I always kind of kept a car, whether it was a pro smart or a pro stock. And that helped me be able to come back to a sponsor later on, maybe the next year and pick up something to be able to go race on my own. So uh, I've worked this thing hard and uh, it's been good to me, but you know, I can't do it without the Lord. Without God behind me, <laughs> this ain't happening, buddy. I mean, people out here think they're doing it without him, but they ain't. And uh, one thing I have to say here, and I won't harp on this much, but every time, and people don't know this, Chad don't even know this, I don't think. He might, because he probably speaks to me sometime when I'm getting in the car and I'm wondering why in the hell I won't say something back to him. <laughs> but I will not say a prayer about my run till my butt hits that seat, okay? Once my butt hits that seat, I will always say, you know, a little prayer. 95% of the time, I, I do. Unless something just drastic happened and I'm jumping in that car so fast and I just, I mean, things are in turmoil. 95% of my time, I just say a little prayer. And I never, you know, I don't think when I was, when I was young, I might have maybe the first five or six years when I was kind of young, didn't know no better. Okay. But I know in the last 20 years or 25 years, when I ask for prayer, I ask to be safe. I ask for the Lord to give me the best ability that I can do to drive a car. I have never, as I can remember, and like I say, I know I ain't in the last 25 years. I have never asked him to let me win that race. I don't, I don't feel like that's right. But I asked him to let me do my best ability that I can do. That's all I asked for. And <laughs> man, <clears throat> has he let me shine at times. So that's that's what I say. It's a short prayer, but to the young folks out here and the older folks or whatever, I just don't think it's right to ask God to win a race. Just ask Amen. Him, let you do your best, and He'll take care of it. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Ricky. I appreciate that. I know many others will. Great advice to old racers and young racers alike. Look, you mentioned the World Door Slammer Nationals earlier brought on by Drag Illustrated, presented by SeaTech Manufacturing. You were there. Jonathan Gray was there as well. You had two cars sponsored by Shrupmasters.com ripping down the 1320 mark. So you mentioned you purchased some parts earlier this year. Y'all heard some parts at the World Door Slammer Nationals, and it might not have went exactly how you wanted it to go, Give me a rundown of the of the Door Slammer Nationals and what you thought of the event overall. Oh, the race! Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, a good race. Uh, the air was a little too good. I didn't, I wish it wouldn't have been. I wish it had been about eight hundred thousand feet worse. You know, it was just so good. We had so much power down there. It was just hard to control. It, you know, and I hadn't done a lot of my racing in that kind of air because I run NHRA and I run in the daytime and we run normally, you know, after March or whatever, and it's starting to get warm. So I, I just was pretty ignorant when it come to racing 
just not getting enough power away from the car right there around 80, 90 feet. And it just took the tire right off of it, you know, first round. I had a good car. I, I got a pretty fast car right now again. And uh, I just, I was disgusted at myself, you know, probably for not being able to keep up with, with uh, the air getting good. But uh, that's okay. Uh, like I told all of them, you know, we heard a motor with Jonathan. First time I've heard a motor that bad in years, okay? And uh, we kind of think we know what caused it. So that's a little bit of a good sign. I feel like we do. And, uh, you know, I give Jonathan, uh, Jonathan has committed to four races with me this year. And I called him up when this race come about. And I said, hey, you want to run this race done? That's a big money race. And I said, we got a good chance to win as anybody if I do my job. Actually, I didn't, <laughs> but uh, as far as crew chief, and uh, he said, sure. So I give him a hell of a deal <laughs> All right, on price. And we tow up a motor, throw the $3,000 hood scoop off in the air. Uh, I thought that if we'd done a normal deal, that I'd probably clear maybe three grand, you know, off of that race, off of Jonathan's deal. And when it ended up all down and said, I was, I've lost about five grand, <laughs> you know, so, uh, okay, that's part of racing, but, uh, we're going on and Jonathan believes in me, I think 200% and I'll give him a good car here for long this year. And, uh, we'll make some other races and he'll do good. Jonathan's won a, he's won a pro mod race in Charlotte a couple of years ago in, in one of my cars and. He knows I try to give him the best I got. I mean, I try to tune these things to the best. That, uh, it, it, I don't, there's nobody can, can say that I ain't got the same jets in that motor I got in this motor. It's all the same. I fought Belushi and Jonathan. When Jonathan come on board, we were running clutches, okay? And I fought Belushi for several years. When I say fought him, not, not fist fight. I mean, I just, I, he, he just very seldom he could run as good as I could. He'd always be down on ET, he'd be down on speed. And, you know, I know people mouthed around and said, oh, he just won't give him what he's got. Well, that ain't true. Okay. And finally, when Jonathan come on board, I run into the same problem with him. I'm thinking, what in the world here is going on, guys? I mean, it, it just pissed me off because I was trying to make them guys run good. I mean, I wasn't even in the car. At the time, Jonathan took over when I had my back surgery. And I was pissed because my car wasn't running good, and I knew they were capable of winning races. So we finally figured out what they were doing on the water burner. They were just glazing the clutch over real bad. And when you do that, it just – I had a turn, and anybody kind of knows a little bit about the clutches. I mean, my clutch was set up normally. I would three and five gram that thing to death all day long, 100 or two on the chip. Maybe change the gear ratio. That's I had a good program. Well, I had a turn and 15 more grams on their clutches than I had in mine, and they would still go out there and just slip going into high gear. Well, that won't run no speed at the eight. They ain't gonna run no speed till then. But makes you look like you ain't got power when they do. So finally, once we figured out, I finally just kept looking and looking, and I finally seen where they were hurting that. Once I straightened that out, they both went to running good again. And Jonathan, like I say, he stepped right up in one shot. But I fought it with, with Belushi two, three, four years ago. Just aggravating his crap. I wanted him to run good, and I couldn't figure out why the clutch was. I mean, I'd recoat it. I'd redo this. I'd put new this. I'd take the clutch out of my car and do the same thing. But they were just messing it up when they do the water burn out. But anyway, uh, I, you know, I'm proud to stand up there on that start line and watch my cars win. You know, I run good. I mean, I'm, <laughs> if I can't win, I'm tickled to death to see them win, you know. And, and uh, Jonathan knows that. He was with me a whole year. He knows who I am now. He knows my family. And uh, I think we got a good relationship there. So, Ricky, something I have been dying to ask since I took a closer look at your race car at the World Door Slammer Nationals is – Hold on a minute. Now. I'll stop – Right here. I got off on the wrong subject there, and I want to correct something here. Go ahead. Because <laughs> well, I know you asked about Chip, but what I want to say, in my early years, those sponsors meant stupid 
to me. They were just, I mean, I just was un, unwhelmed, overwhelmed of having these bigger major sponsors. But to come along here towards the end of my career, I'm still competitive. If I wasn't, Chip, I don't care how much Chip watched me race or who I am. If he didn't think I could go out there and be competitive and have a chance to win a race, Chip wouldn't be with me. Okay. But for him to jump on board and give this old man some another year or whatever he wants to do here, I think he's done made a statement a little bit. What are you going to do next year? I, I kind of looked back at him and laughed. I said, that all depends on you. I mean, I, I'm going to. I'm done when you're done, more likely. So uh, we're going to fight this thing out and, and see what happens. And uh, But I just, uh, what I'm saying here, there is not even words that can tell you <laughs> how much this means for Chip Lawson to come on board and help me here this last year or two of my career. If, if I made a word up, it wouldn't even be fair. Because I don't even know how to say what it means. It, it's, it's so much what it means. So Chip's getting ready to go in and have some surgery this week on his hip. Uh, say a prayer for him. He's a good man. He's in good health. So uh, let's get this old hip fixed up, Chip, and let's get out there and kick some butt. Amen to that. Amen to that, Ricky. Good. Definitely agree with you on that. And Chip is a great guy, and he's impacting drag racing right now in a great way in pro mod, in pro stock, in top fuel. No matter what the class is, he's definitely making an impact. Look, with your pro mod, your car, I noticed when I was there at the World Lord Slammer Nationals, you have got on the car your car number, and it's number 43. And the way that vinyl's cut, it's cut, and it looks like Richard Petty's number. I got to ask, are you a Richard Petty fan? Well, that's kind of hard not to say that. With that 43 on there, I mean, I got that 43 number back when I got the STP deal in 90, I think it was. And I had to search around. Well, some guy had this number, I'm pretty sure, in Texas, and I don't I think he was a little older than me then. Hopefully he's still alive. The people that had it might know who I'm talking about. I, I, I don't even remember now because it was 1990, and I got a hard time remembering what happened in 2015. <laughs> so uh, I found this guy that had this number, and HRA told me who had it. So I called him up, and uh, I talked to him a little bit, and I said, you know, I got this STP deal, and I'd really like to have 43 on my car and uh, he said, man, I got this involved and I got that done, you know, and this and that. And I know you had, you know, it takes, you know, it costs you a little money to change stuff around and free of your car or your trailer or whatever he had, you know, at the time. And, and I forget what I offered him, you know, for the number. I, I may be way out in left field, but I think I offered him something in the neighborhood of a thousand dollars or something back then to let me have that number. And he did. He, he turned that number over to, back to NHR and they let me have it. And then uh, Roy Hill tried to get it not long. He tried to get it from me because even Roy and Petty's big friend, and he, he's always joking. He said, how in the hell did you get that number? <laughs> I just laughed. I said, Roy, that's a secret. I'll never tell you. But anyway, uh, that's how I got that number. And then to me, and, and, and like I said, I'm not really bragging. I'm just, I, I've just, I've been successful in my career, damn near all the way through. And if you ain't, like I say, I, I, I was carrying a number one on my car in 1976, so, and, and super modified. So, uh, you know, if I ain't got a one on there, you hardly ever see me run anything else since 1990 but 43. Because nothing else means anything to me. Two don't mean nothing to me. Three don't mean nothing to me. Five don't mean nothing to me. Ten don't mean nothing to me. I mean, the only thing that means anything to Ricky Smith is number one or 43. Well, Ricky, those are good numbers, whether you're number one or number 43. And you definitely have got the career to go along with a number 43 like a Richard Petty. Look, in where you are at right now in Pro Mod, a couple things I want to ask. 
you mentioned that y'all have in the NHRA a 12 race schedule. One, would y'all like as a class and think as speaking for the class, would y'all like to see more NHRA events? And talk to me a little bit about this new power adder coming into the game, the Pro Charger Boys. Well, first thing, the, the more events, no. I don't, I think I'm speaking for everybody in this class. Uh, this is a good old boys class. Okay, it's a it's just a good old boys class. It's not for people that can come out here and spend two three million dollars. Okay, and most of these guys that run this class, I'd say seventy percent of them are kind of in my situation. Most of them look better in my situation because most of them have got a job to fall back on or business to fall back on to make a living, put some food on the table. I don't. My deal is totally survived on either helping work on a car or a sponsorship to run my car. That's the only way I have it to make money. I, I'm not in the business to build motors or cars or anything. I just want to look after myself as long as I race. And when I quit driving, then I'll go into to another mode, you know, but Everybody's asked me, why don't you go do this? Why don't you go do this or help this guy, help that guy? Honestly, the way I feel about it, I cannot give it 150% and run my car too because I want to win. And I'm not going to share everything I do, no matter how much money you got with somebody else, until I get out of that seat. And when I get out of that seat, then I'll go do my job and I'll give you that 150% what you're paying me for. And that's what I'll do. But I just don't want to take your most every I don't know that anybody ain't took the money and I didn't leave out with their car doing a whole lot better on what it was doing and and, and fixed their car. You know, but uh, I just I just don't feel right taking somebody's a lot of money from somebody and not being able to do 150%. So I just back off. I try to help the people I can a little bit, get them in the right direction, get the car going up down the track. And, and that's kind of as far as I go with it right now. And I hope a lot of people respect me for that. And I know they have in the past. So uh, that's, that's kind of that deal, you know, and, um, the deal on the Pro Charger, man, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess in a, yeah, it flew down there at Orlando, you know, that's for sure. That was a little eye opener for NHRA, you know. Um, you know, I, I done been through some of this stuff with a turbo deal, okay? Spent a lot of money to find out some stuff to prove to myself what was going on, okay? I don't have to take it no farther. I've showed NHRA what I know last year, and that's just the way it is, buddy. I, I mean, I'm a hard racer. I work hard to get where I got, and I'm not going to sit there and watch a car in my own pit run illegal and me go work my butt off and win a race and get weight put on me. And then they laugh at me. That ain't happening, bro. Ain't happening. Not anytime. So uh, respect me or not on that situation there. But I told Belushi, and I have proof for Chad, I told him three races in a row his car was illegal and offered to show him at St. Louis all three races on Friday morning. And he denied, he didn't want to see it, he didn't want to hear it, he turned around and walked off. So he knew that car was illegal in Indy, St. Louis, and Charlotte, okay? They finally caught him in Charlotte. And when they, and I didn't raise no more hell at Charlotte than I raised for the last seven years about these turbo cars. So it wasn't like I went to Charlotte and just pitched a fit like everybody thinks and jumped up and down. Yeah, I pitched a fit when he went Number one qualified twice on the start line because I knew what was, that car wasn't right. 
But when I'm saying as far as do NHRA themselves, I didn't do nothing at Charlotte that I hadn't done for seven years convincing about them cars. So I have the proof. I got the proof. It cost me a lot of money to get the proof. And uh, that's that. Now this pro charger thing, you know, I don't really, I don't really think they can cheat with that thing like they could with the turbo car. But they pretty much got the rules where they want them to start with, you know, it looks like. So uh, I think NHRA has got to stay on top of it. You know, I, to let a new class in, and, it, and this is what I'm going to get at here. As far as letting a pro charger in, I ain't got no problem with that. You, you, you want to let something else in, I ain't got no problem with that. Bring the big motor in, I ain't, you know, I ain't, I didn't have one at the time. I got two now and I won't even run them because they weigh too much weight on them. But if you're going to let something like that come in, I have spent a lot of years and overseas away from home during the winter testing to get where I've got with this nitrous car. Okay. Todd Tedero, a lot of us, D.B. Jackson, he's been overseas over with, you know, I've seen same team. We spent a lot of time developing this stuff to get it as fast as it is. It didn't happen in one year or two years. There's 10, 15 years behind getting the stuff to where it's at. And for NHRA to let a new power to come in and run right in the top five, I say, let's just say the top five is wrong. Absolutely wrong. If they want that car to come in and, they, and they, you want to build that car and you want to run that car, that's fine. But you should be a bottom half qualifying car absolutely the first year. Absolutely the first year. You should not be able to qualify no better than ninth. If you win a race from there, old shots or little luck or whatever, then good for you. That's good. That's fine. But to let a car like that come in with a new power out of it and let it run right up front right off the bat is a big slap in the face to a lot of good racers that have spent a lot of time promoting for a modified. And that's all I got to say about that. There you go. Ricky Smith saying they need to get their upcomings and pay some due coming in to the NHRA. Ricky, look, I'm, I'm dying to ask because I've never heard the story and you've been around for so long now. You've got this nickname, Tricky. Look, how did you get this moniker, Tricky Ricky Smith? I mean, was it starting line shenanigans, uh, pit side pranks? You know, where does Tricky come into it all? I guess it was, you know, me and Warren Johnson, Bob Glidden, Lee Shepard, Bruce Allen, mainly me and Bob and Warren. And uh, it was kind of hard headed. You know, we wanted to beat each other, drove our own trucks done our own tuning. We didn't have no tuner standing behind us over here watching, tuning the car or looking at runs while we were working outside. We had to work outside, run in there and look at the computer right quick, make a call and run back outside. So uh, this was pretty, we were pretty intense on wanting to win. And uh, we done whatever we thought was getting in each other's head. We had a lot of good burn downs back in the day. I mean, Hell, I cut my motor off one year, rocking down. I was running Warren Johnson. We went up there in pre-stage. And I, we just started that old Ford big motor thing, and we didn't know much about them. They'd run hot. They had a lot of friction in them. Then I'd done told John Carter that he was doing my motors. I said, John, I'm going to cut this car off now. If he goes up and plays again, I'm going to shut it off. He said, Lord, don't do that. I said, I'm not going to burn this motor up. So we went up there and showing up. He wanted one to sit there. Well, I said, I just reached up there and flipped the switches off. <laughs> and, I heard him. I knew Warren. You know, you you know, you just know who you race. I mean, I know who I'm racing. And I know 98 percent of the time what they're gonna do and what they ain't gonna do. So I knew Warren wasn't the type of guy that would come up against the clutch and start to go in and then not go in. When he when I heard him, because it was dead quiet in my car. He didn't know what I was doing. It was his motor running. 
when your motor's running, you don't hear somebody else's, unless it's a blower motor real loud. And we didn't have blower motors back then, so we didn't know. He didn't know I cut my motor off, so I could hear him. And as soon as I heard him start to go up against the clutch to, to drag the car in a beam, I just reached and fired mine and went right in behind him. I probably didn't. I probably didn't hold him out two seconds. I probably really come in really quick on him. You know, he's probably thinking I'm maybe gonna hold him out, but I just jumped right in behind him. So, you know, I knew I had whatever five or six seconds, so I didn't even take that advantage. I just fired it, went right in, and had a big hole shot on him, beat him. They all got mad. I know Real Marson was down there; they were ready jumping up and down, so it all be towed out. And, but uh, won the round. I don't know if I ended up winning the race or not. That was about second or third round. But anyway. That's what made pro stock back in the day was these burn downs and me and Warren Clinton having a few words, you know, and stuff like that. And we just had a ball with it. And don't think we weren't serious. I mean, we were ready to fight and we got out on the other end. Just luckily we, we were smart enough to know that if I beat you or you beat me on a whole shot, you didn't walk over and try to congratulate Bob if I beat him on a whole shot, I didn't go around him. And he didn't do me the same way. Now, if I beat him on a whole shot and he walked to me and wanted to shake my hand or say congratulations, then, then that was good. But you don't get out of a car on the other end and you just beat a guy on a whole shot and then you want to roll over and shake his hand too. A lot of adrenaline flowing down there. You're looking to get you're about looking to get knocked out or, or you're going to get knocked out one. It, it, it's a bad situation. So we were, I feel like me and Warren and, and, and back in the day, whether it was Lee Shepard or Bruce Allen, I think we all respected each other enough to know that. So it never was even an incident of that. I mean, if we, if we beat each other and we had a burn down up there, we damn sure didn't get out of the car and go run over there and want to shake his hand and congratulate him, you know, because I beat him. So, that was just respect for each other, you know, good hard racing. And uh, I love it out here. I mean, this, uh, you know, we get into some deals. And me and Troy got into some deals and had a hell of a thing going there. You know, 13, 14, 15, long through there. Man, me and him was at each other's deal, and I'd burn that thing down if I could, you know. And I, my, my favorite saying was, I'll burn that snowball to the ground, you know. I mean, I was talking about the old transmission, you know. But we had a good time. And, and Troy, right now, if he comes to the race, most of the time he's going to come by and holler at me or something. We, we're, you know, we're friends, hold the deal. But, uh, you know, me and Stevie right now, I mean, he's kind of a, uh, I wasn't quite as bad as he is, that's for sure, when I was young. But uh, he's just a little loud about punk, what I call him right now, you know. <laughs> He's uh he's enjoying his you know right now he's having a, a couple of good years here and he's enjoying it so uh, hey roll on you know Stevie I mean uh, the deal will be and I've been there and, and Warren and Glidden a lot of us have been there it's one eight nine ten twelve championship whatever you know John four sixteen okay you're gonna have a couple years that you can't do nothing right. You're doing everything the same. It's just you don't get them breaks. You don't win them races by five thousandths or a hundred or whatever. They don't fall your way. So uh, that's when you find out what kind of champion you are. Because after you're down a couple of time years and you come back, then you're down a couple of years and you come back. Uh, that's when you really figure out whether you're a true champion or not. Is can you pull back out of it mentally after you've had such success for a couple of years and you have two or three bad years, can you pull yourself back out of it and do it again? And uh, I've been able to do it for 11 championships in 46 years, so I didn't win 46 championships. So, uh, and Glidden and Warren and all them didn't either. You know, John Ford didn't either. So, uh, he will have his, he'll have his day. You know, and uh, he's doing good right now. He wants to beat me. I want to beat him. And uh, we're going to roll with it, though. 
the old man and the young punk, I call him. Uh, I love it. You know, I love it. I did, the only thing I asked is NHRA, I hope it don't get me so uncompetitive that I can't be competitive with him. You know what I mean? I just want to be competitive with him and, and see where things fall. You know what I mean? Uh, That's, that's the way that'll roll, you know. We'll see where it goes, you know. And like I said, I ain't got, you know, I keep saying it, but I know I ain't got maybe another year. Maybe Chip will stay with him another year. Maybe he won't. But, uh, I, you know, the way I look at it, um, you know, it's been this way most of my career because I've been able to win championships after the second year I started racing. So when you're winning championships or you or you you're running good like that, people are going to lay, they're going to either red light or they're going to be all over the tree. So it's just, and I know that's coming. It's been that way. And I, you know, sometimes you wish, man, why don't that guy give me a 09 light or one tenth light or 08 light or 12 light or 45 light or something? Why don't I get them? Go back and look at the record book for the last years. I just don't get them. I mean, I might get one out of a couple of years, somebody be 12 or 13 on me. You know, I'm talking about not 012, I'm talking about a 10th late. So when these people are up there being red, double O something, 15, 01, 02s, then to me, I still realize I ain't no double. They're up there doing all they can to beat me because they know that this automatic's kind of hung me up a little bit. But when I was a clutch guy all my career and won all my championships basically in NHRA with a clutch, they knew I was going down the racetrack. I'm going to be pretty fast, but I was going to go down the racetrack. So they had to go to the other end to beat me. So they would just go up there and lay the tree over and hope for the best. and. A lot of them did, a lot of them didn't, but that's where I've always told Chad, and I still tell him, Chad, I didn't win 11 championships for red light. Go back through my career, I'm not a red light. I might do it once a year, and I said, daggone mad, it won't happen again. Because the race is over. When you turn it red, it's over. I don't care what happens, the race is over. <laughs> so, I'm gonna make you run me to the other end. That's my. That's the way I won all my championships and my races. Is you got to go to the other end if you want to beat Ricky Smith. You know, I can't be 15 and 20 on the tree no more. If I stage the car a little deep and do in, maybe I can. But I'm about a 30 or 40 man, and that's about where I'm at right now in my career. So I'm gonna do the best I can. Try to give the chips some good exposure. I'm going to try to aggravate these young kids just like I aggravated the old people back 40 years ago. I'm going to try to aggravate the young kids now the other way. And, and I'm having fun with it. I'm having fun with it. You know, I get a little pissed off and I get a little mad. And the one thing about it, anybody's been around me very long, they know Rick Smith ain't going to hold too much back long. I'm going to say my piece. And then we'll go again and see what happens. So, uh, hell, I'm ready to go racing. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, well Ricky, uh, you keep on tricking away on these young guys and do that aggravating. Now, I'm curious. You mentioned that burn down with me, Warren. Let me, let me see. And let you, me. you mentioned the Stevie uh, being a loudmouth punk. Look, do you think – in classes in drag racing, whether it's from Nitro to Pro Mod, even the sportsman ranks that are at a national event, do we need some of those controversies? Do we need like Tanner Gray's jabbing at a Erica Enders and and creating some rivalries? Do we need that in drag racing regularly? It honest and not just manufactured, but being real in competition. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's the reason I ain't got no problem with Stevie. You know, what I mean. I told him, I had a little talk with him down in Florida, you know, and I mean, I, I help him. I do anything I can for it, you know. Just don't embarrass me too much, <laughs> what I told him. But, uh, 
no, it's, you know, I think it's good. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not fake. Okay. When, when me and Stevie's probably doing it, it's, we want to win and we're on each other's tail. Okay. We're probably trying to get in each other's head, but, uh, I got an old big thick skull, I'll probably say. So it's it's pretty hard to get in my head after all the years I've been doing this, but I, I enjoy <coughs> back and forward and and doing our deal. And I don't want the fans to really get too pissed off at either one of us. Okay, we're we're not uh, making this stuff up to start with. We're serious about what we're saying. But I think also that probably me and Stevie, and, and it could be Todd Tedder. You know, I mean, I, Todd's a good friend of mine over here. Me and him's had our run-ins and burn-downs and stuff at Farmington, okay? But I know one thing. If I need or I got a question, I can ask Todd Tedder, and Todd will not lie to me. He may not tell me what I want to hear, you know, or may not tell me, but he won't lie to me. And that's one thing. I guarantee you, my home, if you can ask Todd Tedero, if he asked Ricky Smith something, I'm not going to tell him a lie. I might say I run, not say I'm about that or whatever. But <coughs> I'll tell you, I'm not going to run you in circles. So, me and Stevie, we're just, we're just having fun right now with this, you know. And like I say, I just want NHR to keep us nitrous car competitive where I can have fun with him, you know, and, and we can get on each other's butt. And, and uh, I'm not, I'm not throwing any of the other racers out. It's just Todd's probably not one that's gonna jaw a lot. Uh, Jim White is probably not one that's gonna jaw a lot. Uh, you know, you know, Stevie, we're probably the only two that really jaw each other. So uh, we're gonna have our differences and we're gonna have our fun. And uh, I just hope I can beat him once in a while. You know. He, he's on. He's on a good roll right now. And, uh, he's young and uh, got stamina. He's going to work hard. Him and his crew. So, uh, me and Chad are going to hang in there and do the best we can. Ricky, definitely look forward to seeing you and uh, Stevie having fun this year, doing some jawing back and forth. Definitely looking forward to that and at the NHRA events and any of the big money events that still may be coming up this year. Ricky, look, you're one of the guys that I can ask these questions and get some answers, but you've been around so long. You're one of the old men of the sport, as Tom McEwen once said in an interview with Steve Evans. So, Buddy Ingersoll shows up in the mid-'80s with that turbo V6 out of an IndyCar. What did you all think in the traditional pro-stock ranks? Well, we didn't think nothing. We knew if they let that thing come on in, we was done. I mean, I didn't have the money to go change the whole program up and do a turbo car back in, and Glidden didn't either, I'm sure, you know, and we'd, we'd spent all this time in development over the years to get where we got, and uh, if they left that thing alone, I mean, it, we'd have been done, you know. So, uh, but he done his homework, got him got him a good deal, you know, and uh, – Got a dang old fax machine ringing here, but maybe it'll quit in a minute. But uh, that was a tough deal when that came along. Man, he was he was rolling up there. I think he beat me at Bristol. And then Glidden finally had to run him in the finals. And Bristol and Glidden beat him. And uh, luckily, the IHRA, you know, seen the right most laws, you know, they're going to kill a class if they let that in because you had one car that could fly. And you had, at that time, we had a bunch, we had 30 pro stock cars showing up or something, you know, 35. So what are you going to do? You're going to run 35 cars off for one? So they were smart enough at that time to realize, let's don't, let's don't let this happen right now. This ain't, this ain't the right era and time for turbos. So uh, that got shut down pretty fast. Definitely. After he uh, almost got Bob in that final round, it, it was it was done after that, and y'all got back to 
things as as normal. Look, the other question I've got. So of NASCAR fame, Rick Hendrick, obviously names like Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, Tim Richmond, but he had a pro stock car at one time that was out there. Do you remember that? Do you remember Rick Hendrick at the drag races at all and, and what type of program he had and the drivers and things of that nature? No. I've been out here a long time. The only thing I know, Rick had some involvement with uh, with uh, Real Marson. He had the Levi Garrett car. Rick probably put that deal together because I think he had some Levi Garrett sponsorship back mm -hmm. in the NASCAR side. And this is just speculation. I don't know. Uh, but I, that's the only time I know that Rick really had much involvement in a pro stock car was kind of through uh, Buddy Morrison and David Rear. It was a brief window. I've got that's something that for me and my looking back and doing some studies of the history of drag racing. I'm like, man, I want to know more about this short period that Rick Hendrick had some involvement in the pro stock world. Obviously, now he doesn't have any involvement in it, but he's done so well in the NASCAR world. So, you have done well in the drag racing world, 11 championships. I, how many wins do you have? By, what's the palette? You know, I didn't really sit down and figure them up, you know I mean? As far as national meet wins, NHRA, IHRA, I'm pushing 100. I'm pushing 100. I mean, I had... 70 or so or something you know, in IHRA and so and I've got 15 now just in pro mod and I think I've won one or two postdoc races over there so I've got either 16 or 17 wins in, in the NHRA so I'm pushing 100 pretty good I'm pretty sure it's in the 90s if not 100 and if you want to call it wins <laughs> you think Start talking wins. I run a lot of local stuff, and I cleaned my basement. I built my house in 1979. About 1980, late 80s, 88, 89, somewhere along there, it was a two-door garage in the basement. That's actually where I worked on a car with Keith Fowler's on the Country Shindig Club. Well, I finally built my little 30 by 30 big building up in front of my house, and I moved everything up there out from in the basement. Well, my wife got tired, and I did too, of the rear end grease smell going all up through the house all the time. She couldn't, she couldn't cook enough pinto beans to kill that rear end grease smell. <laughs> so I finally had to get out of that basement and, and move. I built my little old brick building shop, got a couple of people to help me lay the block, and done that for pennies on a dollar. But anyway, uh, when I enclosed my basement, and took my two big garage doors, roll-up doors, and was trying to figure out what to do with them. The guy come up, the, the, the guy was doing it all, he came up with a suggestion, he said, all these trophies were sitting in there. And I had a ton of just little weekend race, you know, little, I call them $10 trophies. You know, I had a ton of them. I actually had a pickup truck, not a small less 10, I had a regular size bed, pickup truck load of those trophies, not standing up, laying them down. They were stacked level to the top of that bed that I took to the dumpster and just throw it away. Because so I did not know where to put them all. But all these little men you see right back over here, and there's a bunch of them up there, they're just what I've won here in my office in the last, I guess, six, seven years. All my 60 or 70 little men from IHRA and some minute, all that's over. We made trophy cases out of them big garage doors there. He filled them in, made nice wood, stained it, and made shelves. And that's where my trophy cases are. Those two big garage doors, or used to be doors, they're made there are trophy cases in my basement, and that's where I keep most all my trophies. But uh, I've never, not about to throw one of these little men away. They were, I call them little men, and they're the, they the, they the national meat stuff. But I throw a bed load of local track trophies away that I'd won. So 
I don't know what you talk. I mean, honestly, I've probably won, I don't know, 150, 200 races in my lifetime, you know. Uh, but I keep these little men. They, they, they remind a reminder of national meets. Keeping those little guys, reminders of the national meets. Got to ask, out of all the wins, out of all the championships, what is the biggest moment? What's the biggest one of them all? Man, <laughs> that's a tough question when you've been out here 46 years. You've had, you've had several pretty big moments, you know, and, uh, Golly, I mean, you know, there's probably two moments that I'll always remember in this drag racing deal. One of them was when I was the first pro stock car to ever run the seven seconds. I've done it at Rockingham. It was like, I don't know if it's first or second round. I know it was in the finals. I run 798 or something, something, 799. And uh, back in, we didn't have radios. Didn't nobody know what they run, you know, until they got back to the scales or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, when I get to the scales, there's two officials there on scooters. They wouldn't let me get out of the car. They weighed the car. They checked the fuel. And they said, follow us. They escorted me to the start line and they stopped the race on Sunday, the national meet on Sunday, Larry Carrier was the president then. <clears throat> they stopped the race and pulled me up on the start line. I didn't know then. They wouldn't let the crew talk to me. I didn't know what was going on. I, when they first escorted me away from the scales, I thought, man, what have I done? What are they looking for? You know, I didn't have no idea. I knew I wasn't cheating, but I didn't know what the hell they was going to look for. And uh, they took me up the start line and I mumbled around out low and they wouldn't let nobody tell me and then they announced it there you know and all on the pa you know that i had done that and that was a pretty major deal at that time to be able to do that because a lot of people were trying to do it you know and uh, probably the other uh, i'd say the other big moment in my career is uh Bristol, Tennessee. I won a lot, I think, at the time. I don't know where I'm at now, but I think at the time I was probably one of the, if not the winningest professional driver at Bristol, Tennessee over the years. And the me, I mean, I know back in the day, in the IHRA days in the 80s, now, I mean, Ted and them were telling me, and, 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 and I didn't believe it much, but they, they swore back in that they'd call, and Pro Stock was stout back then. Pro Stock was, Pro Stock was a bad, it's bad at Pro Mod now, you know, it was bad. It was, it was people, what people wanted to see. Now, the funny cars and top fuels were, were there, but I had a heck of a name going in. We had a lot of TV coverage, you know, Winston done all this. We had as much good TV coverage as NHRA did. And that's where I got my name from was the TV. And, and uh, so they always told me, said, guys, we have, you are, basically one of the ring leaders that people are calling you won't know if you're going to be here are you going to be here this went on for i don't know five six years seven years whatever done there eight years that was a pretty good honor you know to try to you know have that people calling in and won't know if i was going to be there i wasn't no funny car guy i talked to you you know them were the guys but uh when where i'm going at with this is when they built that new suite and towers up there, they put four names on that thing to start with. The very first four names they put on that tower, and supposedly what I was told was all these were voted on and put in through the media, the people that they thought that should go there. And the first four, when they opened up that deal and, and built this new <laughs> Deal and all was Don Gar was Larry Carey, president of IHRA, Wally Parks, president of NHRA, 
Don Gall, which is absolutely <laughs> the man between him and John Force are the two people that's drag racing. And I'd be damned if they didn't throw Ricky Smith up there with them four guys. Now, <laughs> all the stuff I've done, not all the championships and races I've been, that right there is something that's hard to get done and hard to be respected that hard by your fellow racers or media people that know how hard you work to get to that point. And for my name to go up out with them four people, which as far as I'm concerned, the three <laughs> greatest idols there are in, in, in drag racing, that was pretty badass. That's definitely an honor that not everyone gets. And for you to have your name associated with those other great names, that tells you where you're at in your career, what you've done, what you've accomplished. And Ricky, look, I hope in these sunset period of your career that you have some bright moments. You have some, some stellar moments that you can check out on, and you're like, those moments are even – the top moments of my career. So I hope that's the case for you. Look, for strutmasters.com, dragracing.tv, Monday Morning Racer, myself, Lee Craft, Ricky, thank you for your time today. It has been an honor to interview you, and I know the fans are going to enjoy it. Any last words? Well, I, hope, I hope they do. I hope they realize that this stuff comes from my heart. Uh, I've had, uh, I got to say one thing, I, since I started racing, I kind of, Fred Kepner used to get on me because I get emotional after the wins. But I know where I come from. My family didn't have no money. I was driving bulldozers when I started racing. Uh, I didn't have nobody, to, no rich daddy to help me get started. I worked this out through bar money from the bank. Uh, just just crazy, you know, and, and uh, what I want people to understand is, I'm sure you heard, I mean, I, when I was in high school, I'd fight whatever. The hell, I looked for a fight. I fought monkeys. They broke my jaw. So it ain't like I'm no wuss that I want, and I, I'm not a, I, I don't feel like I'm no pushover when it comes to a man. But when I talk about this stuff, about what I've done, and I get emotional about it, man, all I ask is just realize how hard I've done to get what I got. And I love my fans. God bless Stump Master. I'm ready to go give them hell another year. <laughs> Awesome. Well, drag racing fans, I'm Lee Kraft, the Monday morning racer for dragracing.tv, and that's the legendary Ricky Smith. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you.